Great, thank you so much. Um, thanks for having me. This has been a super fun week. It's been fun to see many familiar faces and to also get to meet a bunch of new people. Uh, it's been really interesting. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about neural networks that have Euclidean symmetry built into them. And by Euclidean symmetry, I'm specifically meaning Euclidean symmetry in 3D. Uh, so these are networks that can very naturally operate on geometry. Um, okay, before I do that, uh, um, so I'm from Berkeley Lab, and I'm the 2018 po uh, Alvarez Postdoctoral Fellow. And for any uh, graduate students in the audience, um, these named fellowships at the, at the national labs here in the States are really great because they give you um, kind of independent research funding, and they give you a travel budget, and it's just a really great opportunity to kind of start your research career. So that's my little um, promotion for, you know, apply for the Alvarez Fellowship um, if you're interested in computational sciences. Um, this is a view of, um, this is the Golden Gate Bridge, and this is a view from the building that I work in, so Berkeley Lab's very lovely, come visit us. Um, and so the work that I'm going to talk about today was uh, stuff that I did towards the end of my PhD, what I'm doing into my postdoc, and that was while I was a grad student at UC Berkeley, as well as an intern on the Google Accelerated Science team. Um, so I'll talk about that. And specifically, we're talking about um, how did these networks work, why did we make them, and also how can we use these to do things like uh, expensive quantum mechanical calculations of atomic structures, and how do we generate new atomic geometries. So let me give you a bit of a, oops, sorry, a bit of a background as to um, you know, kind of where I'm coming from. So my background is that I'm a computational materials physicist. And what that means is that if you give me an atomic structure, so in this case, this is silicon. This is the crystal structure of silicon. So if you tile this in 3D space, that's what silicon looks like if you zoom in on the atomic structure. And what I would do is I would use quantum theory and supercomputers to basically determine where are the electrons and what are they doing. So this is a charge density map of where the electrons are in silicon. They happen to be right in between all the silicon atoms because silicon's covalently bonded. So if you have like organic molecules, you'll similarly have like electrons kind of occupying the middle, but if you can also have other types of bonding where electrons are more diffuse or more of a mess in general. Um, and then what are they doing? This is a very, um, we, we lovingly call these spaghetti diagrams because you have all these bands kind of going across. It is a description of the, or it's a plot of the energy of electrons versus their momentum. And basically by kind of how these bands are curving, you can tell things like how um, bound is the electron in the material, how easy is it for it to, it to move around or not. So if it's parabolic, it's basically like a free electron. And if, if the band is rather flat, it means it's not really going anywhere. So these are sort of the tools that, that I was trained to use to be able to go from an atomic structure to the properties of that atomic structure. So okay, so we want to use deep learning to aid in these sort of searches. We want, you know, this is gray arrow, sort of what we do already. So we do quantum theory and supercomputers. We'd like to be able to go faster. So maybe deep learning can help us with that. We would also like to actually generate new atomic structures to feed through these workflows. So we want to hypothesize new structures. And then what we'd really like to do, kind of the holy grail of computational material science is to do inverse design. So I've got some list of properties I'd like. Give me a bunch of structures that are hopefully synthesized sizable, manufacturable, and all these things that, that we, can, we can use. Um, and then more, more so, we also want to be able to map sort of structures to properties and kind of understand the space that we're looking at. So how do we actually kind of connect these in an in in understandable way? Okay. So then the question becomes, how do we do this? If we want to use deep learning, what types of neural networks do you use? So neural networks, sorry about that. Uh, so neural networks are typically specially designed for a particular type of data type. And, and usually assumptions about that data type are built into the network. So in the following diagrams, I'm gonna use W to kind of abstractly represent weights or operations that the neural network does, and X to represent the input data. So let's say we're using a dense network. In this case, our inputs are vectors. And dense networks are actually kind of built with the assumption that worst case scenario, your components are completely independent. Um, so there's not really any, there doesn't need to be any correlation between these different components for a dense network to be functional. 
Okay, what about 2D images? So we have these convolutional neural networks, and so in this we have the assumption that we can identify the same features in any part of the image, or that we want to identify the same features in any part of the image. And there's also a notion of locality, that pixels that are closer to me are more important for identifying features than those that are further away. And this is baked into the fact that we have this filter that we're scanning over our image that's localized. Um, if we have something like text or sound, um, we have a recurrent neural network because we have basically a, some sort of time series or some sort of sequence in which the next um, part of our data depends heavily on what came before. And so we built that into the architecture. So this is just examples of how assumptions are built into networks for different data types. And so the question I think we can ask ourselves is, what are our data types in materials physics? And um, how do we build networks for these data types? So all right. So I'm going to kind of flip the question around by first saying, well, what assumptions do we actually want our neural network to have? And um, from my perspective, these are the types of assumptions that I, I want. Um, so atomic systems form kind of geometric patterns at varying length scales. Um, but these patterns can occur in any orientation or location in a given example. So I'd really like if my neural networks could understand that if I see this kind of octahedral pattern that's formed in the, these rubidium manganese chloride crystals, where there's a manganese atom here and there's chlorine atoms here octahed octahedrally coordinating them. Um, if I have these two octahedra in different orientations, I want the neural network to understand that that's the same thing, but to also recognize that they're oriented uh, you know, in different orientations. Furthermore, um, the properties of physical systems are described by these things called geometric tensors. And what this means is that physical properties transform predictably under rotation. So if I have this toy example, I have two masses, they're different sizes, um, and they have velocity and acceleration vectors. Now, if I rotate my coordinate system, I'm showing my coordinate system with these little black arrows here. So if I rotate my coordinate system, um, the masses, which are scalars, don't change under rotation. Um, otherwise, that'd be a great weight loss program. Just rotate yourself, and then you'd be a different size. Um, but the vectors do transform with the rotation, and they transform at the same, at the same rate as the rotation. So given these assumptions, um, at least for my use cases, my data types are geometry, so where coordinates are in 3D space, and geometric tensors, the types of properties that exist on this geometry that transform predictably under rotation. And what both of these assumptions actually mean is that I have a system that obeys Euclidean symmetry, which means that um, 3D space has 3D rotational symmetry and translational symmetry. So space itself with nothing in it has these symmetries. Um, and you know, once we put stuff in it, then, then things change. And the way that things change is that you start off with Euclidean symmetry, and anything you put in your system actually breaks that symmetry to have a lower symmetry than what you started with. So I'm going to give a couple examples to make this a bit more concrete. So let's say I have a sphere. So I've put a sphere in 3D space. I no longer have Euclidean symmetry, because now this sphere sort of defines a unique origin. So now I have. Um, this group called O3, which is basically all 3D rotations and inversions. So if I invert this sphere, it looks the same. So we went from Euclidean to O3, which is the orthogonal group, but 3D rotations and inversions. OK, let's say I have a cone. OK, so inversion is broken, because if I invert the cone, it starts pointing down. OK, so we, we have to get rid of, uh, it's not just going to be O anymore. Um, but I still have a rotational symmetry around the axis of the cone. And so I have basically. Uh, SO2 and, and then mirrors, which is more commonly known as uh, the point group uh, C infinity V. Okay, so what if I put a cube? You know, we're kind of whittling down symmetries. Um, so if I put in a cube, now I've, I've lost all continuous symmetries. So there's no continuous rotation that I can do where the cube looks the same. So now I actually have discrete rotations, I have some mirrors. Um, and so this is actually a finite point group. This is the octahedral point group. So one way you could see this is that if you put points on the faces of the cube, you can make an octahedron. And so this is why the cube and the octahedron actually have the same symmetry. Um, but another type of way that you can break symmetry that's extremely relevant to crystal structures is that not only do you, you know, kind of whittle down your rotational symmetries, but you can also keep certain translational symmetries. So if I take the cube, and instead now I stack the cube everywhere in 3D space, um, I've still broken many symmetries. I can't do a continuous translation. I can't do continuous rotations. 
Um, so now I have discrete rotations, mirrors, and translations. And this is called a space group. And this specific space group that has the point group um, of the octahedron is called, you know, very understandably, uh, P dash M or dash three M. Um, or I like to do it by number. There's like 230 space groups, so this is two, two, one. Um, so, so this is sort of how you go from getting Euclidean symmetry to having your data break that symmetry into a lower space group. So if you have a network that has all these symmetries or it has Euclidean symmetry, you have all of these subgroups built into it. OK, pop quiz, because it's Friday. Um, properties of a system must be compatible with its symmetry. So if I sort of give you the initial configuration of a system and I ask you, can it have a certain property, it has to be compatible with the symmetry of the configuration I gave you. So which of these situations where I'm putting the inputs as gray, so if I only tell you gray, uh, which outputs in orange are symmetrically allowed. So we have A, we have two point masses with equal um, vectors. Let's say they're maybe velocity vectors pointing at each other um, of equal magnitude. We have B, two point masses of equal mass that have uh, velocity vectors of unequal weight pointing towards each other. And then we have C, we have uh, two masses of equal weight or equal mass um, with velocity vectors pointing down. OK, so how many people think that A is allowed? OK, we've got some hands. OK, A. How about, uh, does anyone think B is allowed? No, maybe something. OK. C? Got, we've got more hands for C than B. OK, so uh, it seemed like pretty, people pretty much uniformly picked that A is symmetric allowed, B maybe not so much, and then C probably. So actually, only the top one is symmetrically allowed. So what do we need to fix about B in order to make that symmetrically allowed? Um, what we need to do is we actually need to change, we need to break symmetry by changing the mass on this one. Because if these are of equal mass, they can't have different magnitudes. Now, how big of a magnitude this is if you break symmetry, again, that depends on your physics. But the fact that they're different um, means that these two masses or something about that atom or that point needs to be different. OK, so why not C? Well, if I have two point masses here, Basically, I have a symmetry along the axis that the mass is on, and it's rotationally symmetric around that axis. But this vector actually breaks that symmetry. So in order for us to actually have a system that allows for that vector to show up, we need something to break that symmetry. It could be an environmental factor like gravity. So if I told you I have these two point masses, and there's ex this external field called gravity, that's breaking this rotational symmetry along the axis of the masses, then this is allowed. So these are the sort of things that one has to kind of think about when constructing problems with um, Euclidean neural networks. Um, so before I go on, are there any questions about this? All right. OK, so I told you a bit about Euclidean symmetry and, and the various subgroups associated with it. So the rest of this talk, I'll focus on what neural networks with Euclidean symmetry can do. Um, how they generally work, and then I'll give some um, descriptions of some applications that we're using these Euclidean neural networks for. Okay, so some things that these neural networks can do is that if you trained it to classify 3D Tetris pieces, so these are 3D Tetris pieces, um, where it's basically all the different distinct ways you can stack four blocks in 3D space. So if you train the network to classify these Tetris pieces after seeing the pieces in only one orientation, it should be able to perfectly identify these pieces in any orientation. And the reason why this is non-trivial, so you could do this just by looking at the radial distances between the points. Um, however, there's these two pieces here which are chiral. So if you just look at the radi radial distances between all the points, they're degenerate. And so you actually need angular information to be able to distinguish the two. Um, and so these networks are able to distinguish uh, these two pieces using angular information. Um, and so you can just train them on a single example of whatever pattern you want to recognize. Um, and then, then you can show it any arbitrary orientation or translation and it can identify a question. 
Yeah, so, so, and I'll go a little bit more, I'll go into more detail about this, but yeah, basically you have two sets of inputs to the network. You have the geometry, so where are things in 3D space? And then given those objects in 3D space, what features exist on them? It's basically kind of the same as an image, so, but an image, you always have this assumption that your points lie on a grid. So in this case, you may not just have uh, points on a grid, so you have to actually specify that geometry, but I'll go a bit more into detail about that later. Any other questions? I love questions, so always feel free to ask them. Okay, here's another thing. Let's say I have a molecule and I wanna predict the forces on that molecule. But then I also give you a rotated copy of that molecule and I want you to pick those forces. If you use these types of networks, uh, those forces are guaranteed to be the same modulo the rotation. So this is a nice property because if I'm doing molecular dynamics, I want to make sure that I'm not getting different forces just because I rotated my molecule. And the nice thing too is that, uh, I'll, and I'll explain more of this later, but you can actually directly predict these forces um, rather than needing to do derivatives through an energy model. Okay, another thing that's really cool, again, coming from a materials perspective, is there's often this ambiguity in how you represent crystal structures because you're basically trying to express some pattern that tiles in 3D space. And in many cases, there isn't a unique way to do this. You might have a primitive cell, which is kind of like one of the smallest representations. So this is all silicon, which I showed you before. So this is one representation of silicon, kind of with its smallest and its smallest representation where you only need two atoms. This is a bigger one, and then this is a supercell. These are all exactly the same structure. So it'd be really nice if I can give this to my network and have it guaranteed that it's not gonna predict something different just because I just changed my representation. So rather than constraining my representation, I'm baking kind of this, this symmetry knowledge into the network so that I have the freedom to choose whatever input representation is convenient for me, but I still have the same guarantees coming out. So this is really useful. Um, and again, um, for those who are not so familiar with using uh, unit cells, these are always periodic boundary conditions. So again, you're stacking these blocks in 3D space. Okay, so how do they work? Um, I'll kind of give an overview. I'll talk about the inputs to the network. So again, that you actually have these features or the geometry and then you have features on the geometry. Then I'll talk about these network operations, kind of how does it make it tick? Um, how do we look at the kernels? And then what, is, what does the input and output to these networks actually mean? Oops, okay. So first of all, we start off with a sort of regular, traditional convolutional neural network in 3D. Uh, except instead of images, we use points. And the reason for this is that images of molecules and atomic systems are rather imprecise and sparse, or there's kind of a trade-off between the two. So like if I have a benzene molecule and I want to represent it as an image, uh, there's a lot of empty pixels here. So, and it's not gonna scale f favorably as I go to 3D because if I have a, keep having a bigger volume that's scaling as end of the third, every time I just want to add you know, maybe a few more atoms. So we use points. So we basically take our convolutional network and we have to do a continuous version that's operating on points. And if, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the Schnett architecture, this is exactly what they do as well, um, where basically you have a convolution center, and then you have a, up to a certain radius, you have some nearest neighbors, and you're gonna do the convolution over those nearest neighbors. So we do the, exactly the same thing. The thing that's a little bit different is that um, to encode the symmetries of 3D Euclidean space, um, there's translations and 3D rotation equivariance. So that's the part that's different. And again, let me just kind of reemphasize what it means for something to be equivariant versus invariant. So something that's translation equivariant means that, let's say I want to identify rabbits in images. Um, if I can train a network to identify a rabbit in this part of the image, I'm guaranteed to be able to identify a rabbit in this part of the image and identify um, where it moved to. So like that there's a rabbit here and now there's a rabbit here. So not only that it's there, but where is it? Um, so that's translation equivariance. And what's nice is that convolutional neural networks have this baked into them because of reusing the same kernel at all centers. What about rotation equivariance? So if I have a rabbit here and I rotate the rabbit, um, can I get a guarantee that if I can identify this, I can identify that? 
And there's been kind of multiple approaches to this. The most popular one is data augmentation, which in 2D is very effective. You can basically make 10 copies of your data set at different rotations, train your network, and it will be able to sort of identify the same motif in various orientations. Not necessarily with the same filters, but it will be able to at least learn to identify those. Um, this becomes very problematic in three dimensions, because instead of 10-fold augmentation, if you want roughly the same uh, angular resolution, you need about 500 um, examples. And so, you know, that's a lot more training, that's a lot more weights in your network. Um, it's not going to help with interpretability, so maybe that's not as desirable. Another way around this is, you know, the, the, the real issue is that you, when you rotate this image, um, you know, certain things are the same, but certain things are different. So the angular information is different, but the radial information is the same. So what you could do is just throw out all the angular information and just care about pairwise distances between the convolution center and the thing you're convolving over. And this is actually what uh, networks like Schnett do. And so you can just have a, a network that has radial function. So it only depends on radial information. And this is extremely effective in many tasks. However, um, in principle, we really want a network that preserves the information and prefer, prefer, um, preserves the geometry and symmetry of our problem. And so um, this is sort of the mo an additional motivation for why we want to actually bake the full angular um, and radial symmetries into the network. Before I continue, um, I want to make sure I, I give a shout out to kind of all the people who are in this area. 2018 was a really good year for rotation equivariant networks. So all these papers came out in pretty quick succession relative to each other. So this is the paper um, that I'm on. These are tensor field networks, which worked on with my colleague Nate, who is at Stanford, um, and uh, the lovely folks, the Google Accelerated Science team, including Patrick, who's here for the long program. So we put out our paper. Um, then there's Reese Condor and friends. He put out the Klebsch Gordon nets. They actually have a new paper, also Cormorant, which is um, it's dense, but it's 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 got a lot of really beautiful physical intuition in it. So I highly recommend reading that if this is of interest to you. Um, and then also there is a Mario Geiger, Marie Sweller, Taco Cohen, and others um, who put out the 3D steerable CNNs, where these two networks uh, were focusing on applying it to point clouds, and this one was mostly focused on voxels. Um, but so so there's a, there's many people who kind of had. Uh, similar ideas around the same time. Um, so uh, because of this, I, so, so I went to NeurIPS, and I wanted to make sure that I, I got to meet the authors of this paper. And so I got to meet Mario. And so Mario and I got to talking. And we're like, you know, the math of our networks is extremely similar. It would be really great to have all our code in the same place. And so since NeurIPS in 2018, we've been merging our code together. And so now, if you go to uh, SE3CNN on GitHub, um, basically you'll find kind of the combination of tensor field networks and 3D steerable CNNs in the same repository. So you can use the same framework, and you can actually switch between voxels and switch between points fairly easily. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited about this because it's it's really great when you, you get to meet colleagues at conferences and then you end up um, making cool tools together. So um, that's just a shout out kind of to everyone else in the field and also to if you're interested in these type of networks, this is the repository that we're using and, and constantly updating and adding more features too. Okay, so back to how these networks work. So in order for a neural network layer to be equivariant to Euclidean symmetry, and uh, specifically ro the rotations, because we've already kind of expressed how the convolutional neural networks are already translation equivariant, basically what we, we need this to be to, in order to be rotation equivariant is that we can either rotate our input, so I can either take my input, rotate it, and feed it to the network and get the output, or I can take the input, put it through my network, rotate it, and then take that as the output. So I can do it in either order. Basically, it's, it's not quite, I mean, it's not quite saying like the rotation commutes, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but basically saying that I can do this operation in any order um, and have that as output. Any questions on that? Okay, cool. So as far as inputs to our network, so our inputs are um, the geometry and the features on that geometry. So again, giving this example of these two point masses. So I have two masses and right here, and then I have these velocity and acceleration vectors. Now, an important thing about the way that we represent our inputs is that we actually break them up 
um, by how they transform under rotation. So I kind of mentioned before, scalars don't translate or don't change under rotation. They're the same, um, but vectors do. And so we will actually break things up into, OK, these are the features that don't change under rotation. These are the features that change with the rotation. And you can actually have features that cha like change at twice the frequency of rotation or three times the frequency of rotation. They get a little bit more complicated, but these things very much exist um, in physical systems. So for example, if you had a three by three matrix on each atom, maybe representing like a moment of inertia tensor, um, you actually can break this matrix up to be represented by both components that uh, are, don't change in a rotation, so the trace of the matrix doesn't change. Um, the anti-symmetric component changes with the rotation. But then the anti, the, sorry, the, yeah, the anti-symmetric components change with the rotation, but then the symmetric components change with twice the rotation. Um, yeah, so we break this up by frequency. And likewise, our convolutional kernels also need to be comprised of functions that transform with a specific angular frequency. And these are the spherical harmonics. Um, so basically, if we take our convolutional kernel, and because we're dealing with the continuous case, it's some argument of r vector. So if we have no symmetry, it's just some arbitrary w. But in our case, we actually break it up to be a radial component, the radial component doesn't change under rotation, it's rotation invariant. But then the equivariant part are the spherical harmonics here. So spherical harmonics, just to give a reminder, and, and also the, for those of you who um, haven't run into them. So spherical harmonics are, are extremely useful functions because of their properties under rotation. Um, you may have seen them as the solutions to the hydrogenic wave functions. So these are the you know, S, P, D, and F orbitals. Um, they're also generally useful for representing signals on a sphere. Um, but again, they're really intimately tied with rotation um, because they're the basis functions for what are called the irreducible representations of 3D rotations. Um, and so the, the most important things I want you to know is that as you go up higher and higher in frequency, you get more and more functions. Whereas in two dimensions, if I have circular harmonics, I only really I only have like two functions that have a certain frequency. In 3D, there's many more ways to have a distinct angular frequency. And, and this is sort of expressed by the increasing complexity of, of the spherical harmonics. Another thing I want to note, maybe to give some more intuition as to why these functions have particular frequencies. So L equals zero is sort of proportional to just a constant. Um, the L1 or, or uh, single frequency um, spherical harmonics are proportional to x, y, and z. So as you can imagine, if I rotate x, y, and z, they are going to change with the rotation because um, that's basically a change of coordinate system. But if I have higher order polynomials, like these ones that have sort of two components, you could imagine like x is changing and y is changing at the same time. And so that's how you kind of get something that's like with twice the rotational frequency. Um, and you can kind of uh, extrapolate this intuition um, higher up. Okay, so one of the really nice properties about spherical harmonics is that let, let's say I represent a function as a linear combination of spherical harmonics of a given frequency. So these are the L equals 1 spherical harmonics. So I have my, my linear combination of L equals 1 spherical harmonics, and now I'm going to perform a, a rotation of my coordinate system. So I perform a rotation. Great thing is that my signal is still L equals 1. So it's still only comprised of the coefficients um, that they were before. However, um, these coefficients of these functions have changed. So basically what I've done is I've done a rotation, um, not only in space, but also in my function basis. Now this also works if I have like L equals two and I have five functions here and five functions here. Um, so I take a rotation matrix that you can think of there's this function or there's a set of matrices called the Wigner D matrices that basically take in a 3D rotation and generate this change of basis in this spherical harmonic basis. And so this is a very nice property that makes spherical harmonics very powerful. Um, another thing to note is that, so if I have these coefficients, these A coefficients and B coefficients, the norm of those coefficients is, uh, is the same. So the norm is invariant. So while the coefficients will change in the rotation, they're equivariant, the norm is invariant. So just a, that's a bunch of nice properties of spherical harmonics. Okay, here's the tricky part. So um, we have our input 
and it's expressed in these different angular frequencies. We have our filter functions. It's expressed in all these angular frequencies. Now we must learn to combine them. And it turns out that this is not trivial. And so to do this, we need to use what are called tensor products. And tensor products for geometric tensors are actually very um, specified. And so you have to use these things called the Klebsch-Gordon tensors. And I'm just showing this for th in case there's some people in the audience who took uh, you know, introductory quantum mechanics and used Griffiths. Um, if you're starting to like remember second semester quantum mechanics and go, no, not the addition of angular momentum, it strikes again. Um, so it's, it's the same math involved in the addition of angular momentum. But what I really want to take away from this is basically there is a very specified and well-known way to take two geometric tensors and combine them, and it's using tensor products and Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. Let me give you a bit more intuition for that because this table is, is kind of horrendous. Okay, examples of tensor products. How do I combine a scalar and a vector? Easy, I take the scalar and I multiply my vector. Haha. <laughs> so I, I still have a vector. So scalar, vector, gives vector. How do I combine two vectors? This is actually a bit of, you know, kind of a trick question, because there's many ways you could do it. I could take two vectors, I could perform a dot product, and this gives me a scalar, so something with angular frequency zero, that's something that doesn't change, so dot products are invariant to rotation. But I could also take two vectors and perform a cross product, and that'll give me back a vector. And if I rotate those two vectors, that resulting cross product will also change. But I could also compute an outer product and get a matrix. And this ends up, again, this sort of um, complexity that you, you end up getting the trace being uh, invariant. You get the anti-symmetric part rotating with the rotation. And then you get the uh, symmetric components um, rotating with twice the frequency. So this is a bit of a mess. But um, the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients basically specify how we do this. So we don't need to think about it. It's just a function call. We're like, OK, give me the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients that are going to take my L equals 1 signal, my L equals 2 filter to an L equals 1 function, for example. And so what does this actually kind of operationally change for the convolution? So for a scalar convolution, you basically have some filter function that's a matrix. And the matrix is operating on two indices, which are channel indices. I have some input. Um, so in this case, A and B are atom indices pictured here. So A is your convolution center. Uh, B is what you're convolving over. Um, so I have uh, the input, and it has some channel I. And so I'm going to contract the I. So I'm going to multiply the I and sum over it. And that's going to give me J. And so my output will be some output with some atom index A and J because I've summed over all B. So this is a, a normal convolution, just kind of in the continuous formulation. What changes now is this operation is no longer just kind of a, a multiply and sum. It's now this tensor product, which contains these Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. You could imagine, actually, instead of this, just inserting um, some matrix C that, that has some indices I, J, K, and you can contract over that. But basically, it, takes, it combines I and J to produce a new channel index K. Um, and I think yeah, that's, that's really the biggest difference, is that now your output, it doesn't have an index that's the same as your filter has one that's specified from this transformation. So there's that difference there. OK, so let's say I have an input that's L equals 1, and I want to go to an output that's L equals 1. So let's say you know, maybe I had some sort of velocity vector, and now I want like a new acceleration vector because there's some magnetic field or something. Um, OK, so what filters can I use to do this? So it turns out, in order to go from one, uh, frequency 1 to frequency 1, I can use a L equals 0 filter, an L equals 1 filter, and an L equals 2 filter. Those are the only filters that will give me uh, non-trivial results. And so if we kind of represent that as like a 3 by 3 matrix, so you know, because I have uh, something of with three numbers coming in, and I want three numbers coming out. So if we represent it as a matrix, um, we have the L equals 0 spherical harmonics will uh, apply on the diagonal, L equals 1 on the anti-symmetric components. And you can see that there's a sign switch between them for the red and the blue. And then for L equals 2, we have these components on um, the off diagonals, and then we actually have kind of the um, traceless part of the diagonal that these contribute to. Um, the reason why I'm showing you all these pictures is so that I can show you a GIF of what it looks like if we randomly initialize a network and then uh, plot what our filters look like as a function of R. 
So it starts off, the only filter you can use at r equals zero is, is um, l equals zero. So you, when it's the blob, that's when it's r equals zero. And then as you kind of go out, you can see that the radial function is controlling how much of each set of l's is contributing to the filter. And so you get something that kind of looks like this. All right. Any questions about that? Sure. Uh, I look at why you have Oh, yeah. Um, okay. So for this specific case, it's actually like, um, it's the same rules in angular momentum, but basically you just, you don't get any contributions for, for higher terms. Um, so like if, for example, I had, um, I interacted like L equals one and L equals three, I would get two, three, and four. Um, so. So the reason why yeah, they recombine in a very specific way. Basically, yeah, it's like, um, um, oops, sorry. Yeah. So, like, and you, you can compute, like if you compute the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients, this is the kind of the rule that comes out of it, is basically the L of your output is gonna be, the minimum value is gonna be, you know, L1 minus L2, and then whatever the minus of, of that absolute value is, up to adding them. So in the case of, um, like, run across one, you get zero plus one plus two. If you have, um, like, one cross, two, you get um, one plus two plus three. Does that clarify a little bit? And I think another, another way of thinking about this is like the, the highest combination you're gonna be able to get is sort of the addition of both of these. So if you imagine like taking, you know, x times x or like x times y, you'll get something that's like twice the frequency. Um, but you can also get these nice cancellations where like x squared plus y squared plus z squared, even though that has terms that, are, you know, has two terms per monomial, um, x squared plus y squared plus z squared is actually just a circle. Um, so it's just a constant. And so that actually reduces to something that's just, uh, has no frequency. That's like a conserved quantity. Um, yeah, so I can, I can try to give a better explanation offline maybe. Okay. All right, so what about the inputs and outputs to our network? So we can interpret the inputs and outputs to the network as um, numerical features. So, you know, uh, scalars such as mass, energy, we can uh, interpret it as vectors, so forces, polarizations, velocities, this sort of thing. And we can also interpret them as higher order um, objects like moment of inertia tensors, polarizability, um, any sort of complex interaction between two multipoles. Go back one slide, and could you tell us what is trained here, and what is like mm -hmm. coming out of these tables? Sure. Yeah. So the train component is is just the radial component. And so what you would do in this case is you, um, and, and there's a lot of flexibility to this because you can make a lot of choices about your radial function. But let's say um, because this is continuous, so so in the case of an image, your your radial function is just like how far you are from the center. So it's like particular sets of pixels. So if I had a three by three image, this is one radius, this is another radius, and this is like another radius. Um, and so you would basically like learn co like the shared coefficients for these ones that you'd multiply times um, this spherical harmonic. In the continuous case, I'm running out of board space. Let me try this. So it'll be some learned coefficients. Um, for simplicity, we'll just do like A and over some basis functions. Um, and so you'll learn these coefficients. And these, the way that you learn these coefficients can be more complicated than this, but this is just an example if I just wanted to learn some linear combination of a set of coefficients or a set of basis functions, which in this case, let's say they're um, Gaussians that are like spaced. And you'll have like j of these. Are the basis sets really a function of the unit vectors or the 
there between them, or are they just a function of the magnitude? They're just a function. They're just a function of the magnitude. I mean, the B I. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So you just learn a basis set combination, and you don't have to learn any. So these matrices you draw on here, these are just fixed. Then. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. So so anything dealing with the spherical harmonics and the Klebsch Gordon coefficients are fixed, um, but we do have quite a bit of flexibility as to how we articulate that radial function. And the n minimax is irrelevant because you don't have the rational So the m index. So the m index is is highly relevant. I'm just kind of sweeping that index under the rug just because it would make this expression really complicated. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, the m index is extremely important. Basically, your radial function. Um, has to be applied to all m's of a given l. Otherwise, it's not rotation equivariant. Because um, you know, in one situation, your coefficients might be all positive, and then in another rotation, it might be kind of negative. So it, it, you need to apply it uh, the same to, to all of the m's of a given l. Um, any other questions? Oh, <laughs> sure. Are, are, well, I'll just ask one more. Is that, do you typically have these radial basis sets like decay to zero at some fixed cutoff? Yeah, yeah. So usually just for computational simplicity, you do sort of define a radial cutoff. And then you can you can make it have nice conditions such that it dies slowly if you would like. I, I think that's kind of application specific, because there's certain cases where maybe you, you have a lot of knowledge that you can have a harsh cutoff, because you know you're not going to have anything in between or not. But you have complete freedom to choose whatever radial basis functions are, are good for your application. Uh, so Mm -hmm. But are you here, are we talking about the decomposing the environment of, let's say, one point, or do you have a good global center where you start? Great question. So, um, yeah, so, so just as you do for normal convolutions, the center, the origin, changes um, as you move the filter. In this case, we choose our convolution center to be each atom at a time. So you know, you'll go through. I mean, you can think of it as like marching from one atom to the next, but really, you do this. Uh, you vectorize it. Oh no! One moment. Okay, we're good. Um, yeah. So in this case, you each in turn, each atom gets to be the convolution center. And then you'll consider kind of the local environment of each atom. But as you go deeper and deeper into the convolutional network, it can effectively see further out. So in the same way, because like if you do one convolution, you update all the parameters. And now you look at your neighbors again. It's not really the original feature that was on your neighbor. It's the feature of that neighbor after seeing its neighbors. And so that's how the information kind of propagates, um, much in the same way that you would have like a speed of light or a speed of sound. You have information propagating at a particular speed. Cool. cool. Any other questions? Great questions. All right. Great. How am I doing on time? Uh, you have 10 minutes. 10 minutes. All right. Great. Um, <laughs> OK, so we can have things be numerical features. But, uh, and we didn't really realize this until recently, and it's pretty cool. You can actually interpret the output of our networks as geometry. So here's an example of the output of a randomly initialized network um, acting on a tetrahedron with a center. So these points right here um, are a tetrahedron with a center. And just, let's see if people can. So that's a tetrahedron, lopsided. Um, so you can randomly initialize these networks, and then you can get some random output. And you can actually interpret that as, as some sort of plot on a sphere. And you can interpret the amplitude of the spherical harmonic signal at that theta and phi as a distance. And so what's kind of cool is that you could imagine um, using this to actually uh, put new points, so generate new geometry uh, using these shapes by putting points on the peaks. And what's especially cool about this is that is actually a valid way of generating a point set. So you're able to generate something without an inherent order to it. So normally, when you generate things, you're generating channel 1, channel 2, channel 3. And this is a way to generate that has no order to it, which is really useful um, when you're generating geometries that are highly symmetric, because there's no way to specify 
this point of the tetrahedron is channel one, this point of the tetrahedron is channel two, that would break symmetry. Um, so that's kind of, that's a, a cool thing that we only realized like a couple months ago that we could do this and we're still sort of figuring out all the ramifications of all the things you can kind of do with these networks because you can sort of um, go between your physical geometry uh, and geometry that your signal is representing and kind of go back and forth between these. Okay. Uh, so in the last 10 minutes, I'll, or last probably eight minutes at this point, um, I'll cover some applications of Euclidean neural networks, and I'll stay a little bit high level, especially see if it's a short time. Um, so you can apply these for um, doing molecular dynamics. So my collaborators, um, Simon Bassner, who's in Boris Kaczynski's group at Harvard, they've been using these networks to do molecular dynamics on the MD17 data set, which are molecular dynamics trajectories on the following molecules. Um, and I don't have the results here because I, they're, they're writing up their paper right now. So if you're interested in this, I strongly, oh, I don't have their names on there. Um, oh, no, they're right there, okay. Um, I strongly recommend getting in touch with them because they're, they have a lot of really cool results and a lot of cool plots showing that, it that they're able to um, reconstruct all the vibrational properties of all these molecules, so it's really neat. Um, okay, and then one application, so um, Alex, who spoke uh, earlier in the program, is on this paper. Um, so Christoph Schutt and friends over at TU Berlin, they've been using these neural networks to do something really neat, which is basically given um, a court, uh, given a configuration of atoms um, produce the Hamiltonian, so the mat Hamiltonian matrix of uh, that molecule in the basis of local atomic orbitals. And so f local atomic orbitals usually have a radial function and a spherical harmonic representing, you know, like S, P, and D orbitals. So you have a matrix that kind of looks like this. So if I had water, you'll have um, the oxygen, oxygen interactions, hydrogen, oxygen interactions, and so forth. And what's cool is that once you, once you have this matrix, if you can predict it with high accuracy, this gives you the wave functions and the energies of that molecule. So you can basically uh, avoid a very, you can avoid an expensive quantum mechanical calculation if you can train this to high accuracy. Um, and so they, they had a really cool network that's able to do this, um, but the problem is that this Hamiltonian matrix changes wildly um, under rotation. And so we've been working with them to make a rotation equivariant version of this network. And just, oops, just to show you an example, um, so if I had a water molecule and I have a Hamiltonian matrix, this is just water, like undistorted, and you can see how much these pixels are changing. Um, so it'd be kind of a pain if you really need to augment to, in order to understand like all the different rotations of this matrix versus we just need one example. So we can overfit to one example and produce this entire matrix with, with the network. Um, but we're also going beyond that to training on like dynamic data sets like they trained in their paper. So this is something that we're working on right now. Another thing is that um, Raphael talked earlier about coarse graining. Others have talked also about coarse graining. Um, so we were talking with Raphael and his student Wuji, and, and we were interested to see if we could do rotation equivariant coarse graining. Um, so in this case, you have some full atom um, configuration. You want to coarse grain it to a simpler number of atoms, and then you want to decode the molecule. Uh, there's this problem in this case uh, where you know you lose information by coarse graining, which is uh, as you should because uh, it, it is a simpler picture. Um, they're not able to you know reconstruct. They don't have a way to sort of sample the configurations of these benzene rings that rotate, and so they they predict the ensemble average. So we were wondering if you know how would a rotation equivariant network deal with this, and are there ways that we can help them sample these different configurations? configurations. Um, so we came up with this test problem where we have these tetrahedron. You can tell I, I like these tetrahedron a lot. Um, and you have a chain of tetrahedron, so they're sharing edges. And so you show it the coarse grained version, so you show it just the tetrahedral centers, and then you see if you can predict the spherical harmonic signal to reconstruct the tetrahedral chain. Um, so here's an example if you train the network and you only give it the coarse graining centers. What I'm showing here, um, you have these spherical harmonic signals and where the peaks are, that's where it's predicting the points to be. Uh, it's not scaled out because that would uh, obscure the red points, but imagine that it's actually scaled correctly so it would predict them in those positions. And the thing that I want to show you is just as um, in the original case you get some sort of ensemble average, um, in certain cases here you're actually not able to um, have enough information to pick a distinct orientation of the tetrahedron, which is when it's straight right here. You've got these little cups 
that are rotationally symmetric. Because all I gave you was a chain, and it's rotationally symmetric. So it, you actually need more information to break that symmetry and for the network to pick a direction. So this was kind of a cool result. Um, now it turns out that you can also add a symmetry breaking vector, and then you can effectively reconstruct the positions. But you do have to actually put in an additional input that takes the symmetry of your coarse grain atoms, breaks it so that it can actually recover um, your original configuration. So this adding this symmetry breaking vector is a way of doing sampling. Um, so this is something that we're also, oh, I'm sorry that these are off. Yeah, on my computer they were, they were in line. But um, yeah, so this is the connection here. Uh, another thing is you'll notice there's this kind of bouncing towards the beginning and the end. And this was driving us nuts because we couldn't figure out what was going on, like right here, this bouncing right here. So it turns out, we don't, oops, did I? OK, so it, it turns out um, when it's doing this, it's hitting a critical angle. So these, these tetrahedron will form a spiral if you were to add more of them. And the bounces correspond with when it gets a, um, like new symmetry on this chiral chain when it has a, the chain has a certain periodicity. So this is kind of weird. So something symmetric like with symmetry is actually going on here. We don't understand it yet because we only like figured it out last week. Um, but we're really excited because we think we're going to learn something. Okay. How many more? I'm probably over time. So OK, OK, well, <laughs> quickly, um, the thing that really got me into deep learning was generative models. And so uh, I really wanted to figure out how to make an autoencoder for discrete geometry operating on points. And this is a hard problem because effectively you have geometry. You would like to map it to a, a vector, which is basically a trivial geometry with a vector on it. And then you want to go back out. So how do you actually go about this? Um, so I think what we can do for at least atomic structures is that we can use the knowledge that uh, atomic structures are made of different hierarchies. And so what you would really like to do is you would sort of like to recursively encode the geometry and recursively decode it. So we know how to encode the geometry with these tensor field networks, but how do we encode the hierarchy? Um, how do we decode the geometry and decode the hierarchy as well? So this is kind of a sketch of how we're currently doing this. So this is something we're working on right now. Um, and we, we have like test networks for doing this. They're very slow, but they're, they're so far able to work on Tetris. Um, Basically, what we start off is you convolve. So if you have these two tetrahedron, you convolve to featureize these different atoms. Um, and then what we actually do is that then we want to kind of figure out these clusters. What's going to be our clusters for the next layer? And the way that we do this is we actually will have each atom create copies of itself. Because in this situation, this atom, for example, might want to be part of this cluster and this cluster. And so we enable it to be able to do that. And so once we've done this sort of blooming operation where it copies itself, and then we cluster them, um, then we do sort of a selective convolution. So if this point was made up of points from here, 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 and here, um, you do a convolution just over those neighbors and featureize your next thing. And then you'd kind of put this back through the whole system again. And then to decode, you start off with your trivial geometry with some uh, spherical harmonic feature vector on it. You use part of that to generate the new geometry and part of it to um, then you do another convolution where this guy is going to look at this guy, this guy is going to look at this guy, and do another convolution to get its new features. Um, and then you would do this recursively again. Um, OK. So I want to give a big shout out to uh, my interns from this summer. So Mario Geiger, who is, who's uh, one of the co-first authors on, on the Spherical CNN's paper. Ben, who's a master's student actually with Frank. And then Hashim, who I didn't show his work, but he's amazing. He's an amazing undergrad at UC Berkeley. Uh, and then also I want to give a, another shout out to my collaborators on the tensor field networks. Um, and so just to summarize, Euclidean neural networks operate on points and voxels and have the symmetries of Euclidean space. Um, so the inputs to the network lower the symmetry to whatever subgroup is appropriate for the problem. And um, yeah, symmetries of outputs are constrained to the inputs. Um, we, you, these networks can naturally handle geometric tensors and geometry. And the convolutional filters, the way that we accomplish this is because the convolutional filters are built from spherical harmonics. Uh, and then we have to do tensor products to accommodate for the fact that everything in our network is a geometric tensor. We have many applications. We expect these to potentially be useful. So reach out to me if you have any questions. Here's our code, and here are the papers, and this is my email. So thank you.